Good. Okay, so people have really gotten on the Q&A bandwagon, so I'm excited to see some of these and see where we go with some of them. Um, I'll try not to be too repetitive, and one in particular I'm going to save till last because it's such a fun question. So, But I'll start with the very beginning. So, Jason, this came from just almost the very start of your talk, so I just want to know how you would address it now, given everything we've talked about, but... Let's see here. So we have a question from Kevin. We have new people attending our online service, but the question is, how do we engage with them? How do we develop and deepen the relationship with them? It's a great question. I appreciate you asking it. Um, a couple of things I think we need to keep in mind. Number one, uh, we have to teach people that it's okay to chat in worship. They've never been allowed to do that before. It's a new way of thinking. In fact, I've been encouraging churches I'm working with. I'm, I'm right now coaching about 75 churches on uh, both and worship. And um, I'm encouraging churches to actually invite people to take their phones out and mute them so they can participate in the chat in the room as well. One of my favorite things to do is to do a digital passing of the peace. So take out your phone, mute it. Those of you in the room, say hello to those who are worshiping at home. And those of you who are at home, let's greet one another in the name of Christ this morning. Uh, so number one, I think we have to teach them. Uh, number two, nobody wants to go first. That's often what is the biggest barrier. And so I would encourage you to have a couple plants. Ask a couple people ahead of time. Um, hey, this weekend, I'm going to ask a question. My question is going to be, who is Jesus? Well, you, you've got all week to think about it. Would you mind just putting something in there? There's a great video. Um, you can check it out on YouTube um, called The First Follower. It's a, a, a leadership lessons uh, by a guy dancing. It's, it's not exactly the title, but it's very similar to that. I saw Lynn Sweet use it one time in a training. And it shows this crowd of pe people. And this guy gets up and he starts dancing real crazy. And everybody's just staring at him. And then one other guy goes over and starts dancing with them. And then two or three come over. And then it's like, a huge crowd and then it's everybody and part of it is that nobody wants to go first but once you get the prompt the pump primed and you teach your people how to chat um it it really can open up lots of wonderful possibilities in worship i love it thank you for that permission to get out our phones during worship um i i noticed some people in the chat talked specifically about leading youth groups and how difficult that is Boy, I know my youth group really enjoys when I say, get out your phones, <laughs> get out your phones, look in a Bible app or, you know, chat like that. So good. Thank you for that permission. And just that new way of seeing things and, you know, we're open to it. Yeah. Um, okay. So another question is from Alan. Problem, the online attendees not participate nor financially support the church. Sure, we can do online contact a lot of people for a lot of people, but the type of service and the emphasis of the service in reality is for the in-person congregation and it's different for them. Do we get more contemporary for a virtual audience or stay traditional for the in-person congregation? Do you have, uh, Jason, do you have comments on, you know, do we get more contemporary yeah. with online? I mean, I, do you have to be more of the moment? Uh, I don't think that any certain worship style you can do really great both and in per, uh, uh, tra traditional and non-traditional. I don't think a worship style, the only worship style that I don't think works either way very well is blended worship uh, because blended worship is everybody hates something in the, in that service. You know, the people don't like the drums and the other people don't like the hymns and you do hymns with drums and guitar and everybody hates it. Um, what I would say is, um, and I wish, you know, I've got a whole two and a half hour training I do on that, almost all on that particular topic. Um, it's hard to hit it quick, but I would say, number one, you got to teach people how to give and you got to teach people why to give. You have to tell the stories of where your offering is going. Uh, people don't want to give to pay the light bill. They want to give to see lives transform. So tell the story of where your offering goes, C uh, create a video, interview somebody that's part of that soup kitchen that you serve or, um, the, the backpacks that you fill up with school supplies, you know, uh, show, tell, tell the stories. People get excited about giving when you do that. I think too many, too many of us are just saying the link for the offerings in the chat or whatever, and we don't really walk people into why that's so important. Yeah, I think that that transcends pandemic even giving is, uh, it's tricky. Um, so thank you for that advice. Um, I'm gonna go to Robert. He says, church is community. 
but community is not always in the church. We must be in the community, be it in person or the internet. This is not going to change. What do we do to help redirect the church body to change old thinking and processes? So old thinking and processes specifically regarding community, Jason. Yeah. Um, I wrote a book last year called From Franchise to Local Dive that is really kind of about that particular uh, subject. It's about how to create a new recipe. And so much of it is, uh, the subtitle is um, Multiplying Your Church by Discovering Your Contextual Flavor. Um, the thing is, is we should be, be spending as much time outside the walls of our church physically as we do inside them. Uh, I know pastors that office at coffee shops, so they intentionally get interrupted all day long. So they get to know people in the community. Um, it's really hard to create a recipe for worship when you don't know the people that live around you and what their appetite is and, and so on and so forth. Um, what my co-author in the book talks about, um, he calls it uh, exegeting uh, the culture, exegeting the culture around you, you know, getting to know the cultural context and um, asking those kind of questions. So there's so much more I could say, but 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 not the time to say it at this moment. But I, that's where I'd get started. Get help people see the value of knowing your community because that will shape what you do in in your hybrid, um, you know, worship outside the building. Thanks. And that uh, sounds like you have some resources that will address specifically that. And that takes us, you know, full circle back to even why we're here, leaving the building, redefining that community. And so, um, you know, thank you for sort of circling us back to there. Um, so I have a question from Evelyn. Is it here? Sorry. Okay. So Evelyn says, and there are, if so, what are the new metrics? Okay, so the question is, what are the new metrics needed to evaluate our effectiveness in the new normal? So that's a great question because, you know, our old, the old metrics were uh, how many people were in worship. <laughs> so yes. what are some new metrics we can be using? It was so much easier when we could just uh, count butts and seats. I know that's like the worst way to say that, but, you know, that was the way that a lot of us did it. I don't think we know exactly yet. Um, but I'll tell you this, um, I, like I said, I'm writing the both and uh, book right now. And, and uh, I found this really interesting article that talked about how every major television network, except for CBS, which skews the oldest, has decided to no longer take into account the real time Nielsen ratings. Nielsen ratings have since 1952 are what uh, determine whether a show was successful or not. What they've recognized is that we consume content differently now. So now they're looking at the DVR numbers and the streaming numbers over the live numbers. So even in the entertainment industry, they're having trouble figuring out. A lot of movies now are, are releasing at the same time in the theater and at home. And so we have to think differently. Um, I would say it's, it's about engagement. So what does your offering look like? Uh, are people participating in your online Bible studies, your groups? Um, are they participating in your missional projects? You know, those sorts of things. That's a different way to measure, but I think that that's probably a better way to measure uh, than, than how many people, how many warm bodies you had in the room anyway, because these are the, the sold out Jesus followers who are actually making ministry happen. Awesome. Back to the idea of on demand, you know, entertainment yes. on demand, worship on demand, community yes. on demand. So yes, yes, good. very good. Um, so now we have a question from David. We have a few or one third of the previous attendance is coming back to in-person worship. So only a third and online service is recorded separately. How do we engage and connect people who are watching online who have, or who have been dis disengaged from the church? And I ask that um, knowing that some of the, um, some of the uh, words that I noticed coming through the chat or throughout the whole time today are things like, I feel disengaged. I feel, hold on, I'm getting to, getting to my list. I took a good list. Okay, so people say I'm disconnected. It feels scary. Um, you know, I'm struggling. I'm grieving for what was once there. So, so we're talking about engaging, connecting people who are watching online or who have disengaged from the church. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, well, I think that a couple of things are really important, and I, I sort of hit a couple of these, but uh, first of all, you have to actually talk to them. 
you will lose people online. Like the novelty of this is over. It's been over for a while. It was kind of exciting at first, like, oh, church is online. What are they going to do this week? And, you know, there was almost a sense of intrigue and mystery about what was going to happen. Um, there are a couple of things I talk about in my my both and webinar, um, one of which is creating more of a narrative thread in the worship that you create. Sometimes worship feels like it's a pageant or a variety show where everybody gets up and they do their act. And oftentimes there's no relation from the music to the scripture reading, to the children's sermon, to the adult sermon. So we've got everybody kind of doing their own little thing that sort of works in the room. I mean, I could make an argument that it doesn't work in the room, but in the room, you have a captive audience at home. All I have to do is click a button and I can anonymously leave. My pastor is not even going to know you wouldn't get up and walk out most likely if things didn't relate. So I think that's one part of it. Um, I think that um, engaging folks uh, through the chat, even if you're pre-recording, uh, there's a pastor that I'm coaching in Wisconsin who um, makes sure that she asks a question and she pauses a moment uh, so that people can respond to it. It's pre-recorded. She watches it live as it's happening and responds. So um, the week I was with her, she said, uh, what's something you're thankful for this morning? I just want you to name it in the chat. What's something you're thankful for? And someone said, fresh strawberries. She's like, oh, I love fresh strawberries. And someone said, um, I have a wonderful strawberry pie recipe. And somebody else said, I would really like that recipe. And someone else was like, count me in on that. And so all of this interaction and engagement happened because she designed it into the experience. Um, I guess the last thing I would say is just, just to be careful about your language. Um, here's one other little tip for you. And I know we're, we're coming up on our time here, but um, you know, we do communion now with these little hermetically sealed packs or whatever. Communion is this weird thing with hybrid worship where at home, it often feels like we're just watching other people take communion. We, we don't get to participate. So uh, one pastor I'm coaching right now in Savannah, Georgia, um, this was his idea, not mine. I, I, I've just been telling everybody about it. He calls it breaking the fourth wall. So some of you know that in film and television, that's when like the actor talks to the camera. So Ferris Bueller's Day Off. What Cameron doesn't know is this is going to be the greatest day ever. And then he goes back into the scene. So here's what they do. He has a microphone that is, you know, the little uh, countryman over by his mouth. And then he's got one clipped to his collar that is for the online audience. What he'll do is he'll do the communion liturgy for everybody, including the people online. And then they turn this mic off in the house. And then he like turns to the camera and he says, for those of you who are worshiping with us at home today, we are engaged in the act of holy communion. And so that's a sacrament. And I can remember the first communion. And so he spends the whole time. Now others are serving communion. He spends the whole time talking to people at home. If, if you'd like to participate in communion, here's how we do that. Uh, um, and then when it, he can see the room and when the room gets finished, he'll say, let's rejoin the room and thank God for this wonderful feast that we've been a part of today. Friends, let's pray in this moment. They turn that mic back on. And so there's this engagement thing that happens where people at home don't feel like they're an afterthought or uh, spectators. They're actually really a part of it. I'm sorry, that probably went too long, but. Um, awesome. No, and that's, um, you know, I love just how you're able to expand on sort of the questions that we have. And um, so I really appreciate your wisdom on that. So I have one more question that's kind of along those lines, and then I'm going to end with kind of a fun question, and then um, we can close this up in prayer. All so right. Lonnie says, so along the lines of keeping people's focus and interacting with them um, in worship, Lonnie says, does anyone have ideas to keep keep folks going during the online um, they get bored so easily. And you talked just a little bit about sort of that storytelling flow of worship. You know, one thing connects to the other. How would you address uh, boredom in worship? Because like you said, we have the option of turning it right off if we want to. Yeah. Um, anything else to add on that? Um, well, a couple, couple things. Um, number one, we've been uh, allowed to be distracted in worship long before we had phones and things like that. You know, I, I, when I remember when I was a kid counting ceiling tiles in a church because I was really bored uh, at one point, you know, um, part of it is just the, the expectation that you create when you create truly hybrid worship. Um, my friend, George Ashford, that I've mentioned a couple of times with the amen corner, his people know that when they tune in, he's going to say, I want to see some hearts. I want to see some thumbs up. 
when I was with them in person, he said, I see sister Betty, you have a comment here. He actually took his phone out while he was preaching, sat it down. He said, I'm going to look at a comment here from, I'm going to look at the comments. Let me see what you all are saying. And then he says, sister Betty, I know you've been dealing with some stuff that's been really difficult. And he starts to, he starts quoting scripture. He starts preaching a sermon that only happened because that comment happened. And so it actually helped shape the content of the worship experience. So there's a dialogue. I, I talk about the idea that we move from monologue to dialogue. Now, if we truly lean into this hybrid thing, um, people will not, they'll be much more interested in being a part of it if they feel like, hey, my comment could become part of the sermon. Here's something else you all might consider doing. And, uh, and then I'll stop talking. Um, and that is you might ask a reflection question at the beginning of worship and let those things collect. So our reflection question today is, who is Jesus? Just put it in the chat. Who is Jesus to you? You might ask it again a little later. I just want to remind you, our question today is, who is Jesus? And then in the sermon, you might actually leave a moment to say, we've had some really excellent reflections on who Jesus is. Ruth, you said, Jesus is my everything. What a really great reflection. I wish I could live into that. I don't always do that as well. Lonnie, I saw that you said that Jesus is my all in all. When you hear your name, when you hear uh, your thought, your reflection, it, it's incredible. It's like I'm, I'm part of it, even though I'm not there. And I think that that really curtails some of that boredom uh, that we that we're talking about. So Jason, Sorry. once again, once again, you've given us permission to do things in worship that maybe we haven't done before, you know, be interactive in that way. And uh, so just the idea of thinking of worship in a new way, I really appreciate Thank you. So our last question will be <laughs> should be an easy one, but it's kind of fun. And we'll end on that. Um, so Daryl asked that your company, Midnight Oil Productions, um, for everyone who's watching, that's Jason's company, Midnight Oil Productions, is that a reflection on the song Midnight Oil from Phillips, Craig, and Dean? No, no, um, no. I, um, when I started, I, I was on staff at, at Ginghamsburg United Methodist Church uh, many years ago, and um, the, my um, partner in ministry at the time there at the church was writing a book called The Wired Church, and I did the CD-ROM for it. And so we said, we need a production company for this just for fun. And we had just studied the um, story of the 10 bridesmaids who had to keep the lamps lit uh, and prepare for the master's return. And so uh, that was part of it. And then I'm also a night owl and uh, I stay up too late uh, too often. And that's often the case. So it's dual meaning, midnight, burning the midnight oil, but also it was tied to that parable. And so uh, that that's it. Some people ask me if it's the Australian rock band, if that's why we named ourselves Midnight Oil, the famous song about the beds burning. And I'm like, no, that's that definitely has nothing to do. With no, <laughs> no, but it does sound like you have some musical options if you ever, you know, need some background music. So there you I, go. Used, I used to get fan mail sometimes for them uh, from at my website. So good. OK. Well, all right. Um, I think we're ending our time today and we just can't express just how thankful we are for you being with us, um, just pouring into us in this way and encouraging us as laity to go into our churches and, and um, be the ministers that we're called to be. And I thank you for that.